Jennifer, how are you? Great, fabulous, how are you? I am feeling a little bit better. <laughs> awesome. awesome. I had, while you were having a party on your birthday last week. Who does you, that? Where you turned like, I think 25. Even though I, you, okay. I, I was having a cue ball taken out of my hip and or whatever, my hip was being replaced. And the reason I had this backdrop, it's the backside of Mount Kailash in Western Tibet. Yeah. And this is the spot where I took my friend's hip, my friend who had, Paul Tracy, who had had his hip replaced, titanium hip, passed away. His mother sent me some of his ashes in a small little Tupperware jar. And as I was coming to go, whatever, as I was leaving for India to make a Bollywood movie, I thought, oh, I'll take some of his ashes. Maybe I can scatter him in the Ganges. I took a spoon and went into the cup and there was his flipping hip, the <gasps> thing, the ball, the titanium ball. And my friend Dave, whose birthday was yesterday, said, the thing he hated most in life, he willed to you. So I took it with me. And after the movie was made, uh, the Bollywood film, My Bollywood Bride, I was making this film in Tibet, Journey in Tibet with Robert Thurman. And we did a circumambulation of that mountain behind me, Mount Kailash, the most sacred spot on earth. And right around here, there was a stupa, big tall thing made of stones, maybe 20 feet high. And I took that thing out of my uh, camera case and jammed it right into the middle of that stupa. So my friend Paul's hip is holding up this <laughs> side of the planet behind me. I don't know why that sounds so funny to me. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It was odd. Can I say? I also heard his voice. And so, you know, this is in line with our flip side. Yeah, it was very strange. I was walking on this trip and I was thinking, God, it's, you know, 16,000 feet, whatever it was, 18,000. And I was thinking, this is really hard. And I heard his voice in my head, clear as a bell. He had passed away maybe a year earlier. And he said, you think it's hard for you to walk? Imagine me. And he had had two hip operations and always had a limp. And I was like, what? I literally heard his voice. Like, I can hear yours. And yeah. I said, Paul, is that you? And then I'm thinking, is this the altitude? Is I'm hallucinating? And he said, you were responsible for the most happy day of my life. Oh. And I thought to myself, what is he talking about? And in then the vision happened in my head as I'm walking along. And I saw this creek in Ohio near Brecksville. One day when we were teenagers, we got lost back there. And we found a water hole. You told me that. Yeah, I did. I Because we have talked to Paul. No, I told you that. He told me that. Oh, yeah. That's, Paul has already told you this. But we were on this water, you know, this water thing, and you jump off into the lake, and it was very bucolic, and it was very memorable, it was, and I had completely forgotten it. But he was pointing that out to me. So, Paul, in honor of you, your your birthday is not today, but I just thought of this, and I had my hip replaced, and you know, you can imagine that's, how many times I thought that's why you were getting us so confused. And today is the eighth, right? I am just confused anyway, because they give me things. They take me, they give me drugs. And, then, <laughs> and I thought it was painful. For, I thought it was painful getting older. You're right. Hello. Anyways. I actually, I actually feel like I'm 30. I feel really good. Well, cup, cupcake, you do look like you're 30. So <laughs> something's working. Thank uh, you. That's a new, you know, diet health regime. Talk to the flip side and yes. you can become... It's a spirit diet. All right. Spirit. So, Luana, you know, we missed you last week. Um, and I appreciate you. Oh. My dad is already here. Hold on a second. Why is it that it takes me talking to you to have my dad show up? Hold on. Hi, Jim. How are you? Go ahead, Jim. What do you want to say? The floor is oh. yours. Oh, he just said he's excited to go to Mexico with me tomorrow. <laughs> Very good. Ole. And then... He loves, like, he loved Mexico. He took my mom there several times. He's so happy they traveled there together. He spoke fluent Spanish from his mission that he had in Argentina where he learned it. Wow. He, I did not spoke, know that. Yeah, he spoke fluent Spanish and he just loved the people. And considering every night how much I love Mexican food, we probably were Mexican at one point. Who knows? 
I had an unusual dream. I don't know, was Jim, were you involved in that dream that I had the other night about being in Mexico? Yeah, he just went like this though. Like it was a, whatever kind of dream it was. Wow. Well, it was a, it was one of those dreams. Like, you know, I was being uh, harassed or chased yeah. or something like that. That's crazy. He goes, it was crazy. It was a crazy but, dream. But That's here's crazy. the weird twist is that at some point I realized I was being driven to a rescue. Like somebody had shown up and they were a cab driver. And I'm looking at the cab driver and I just had the presence of mind because I was kind of awake and asleep. And I said, and who are you? And we were speaking in Spanish and he answered in English, my name is Carl without any accent. And I went, so you're an actor playing the role of the cab driver. And he said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I said, so do you do this often? And he said, yeah, when people need me. And it was like he was playing the role of the guy who was driving me to safety because mm -hmm. you know how Jimi Hendrix has shown up so many times to play a role yeah. in yeah. helping people cross into the other side. He was saying that he often shows up in people's dreams, even though he doesn't know them, but he's recruited to play a role or a part. That's awesome. I wonder what kind of currency they get paid up there. <laughs> you know, and I asked him, are you, are you on the planet or not? And he said, I'm not. And I said, is this something you like to do? He said, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> you know, you're playing a role and, and it, you know, it helps people. It depends right. what role you're playing, but, you know, it helps people. I mean, it was a dream within a dream. It's like a cover. It was like, you know, inception. inception. Yeah. Yeah. Carl Rodriguez, he told me his name was, but without no accent. Anyway, Lou, Jim. Who's on our VIP list today? Who wants to talk to us? Hold on one second. My dad's reminding me that it's his birthday. Hmm. On the 12th. Happy birthday, Jim. Monday, and that's the day that we come home from Mexico. So I guess we're gonna celebrate it there as well. Very good, that'll be fun. Okay, Lou, hold on. <laughs> He's, she's saying suck it up Richard you're always a baby when it comes to pain so <laughs> let me ask you Lou all of the things that happened around the operation that were related to you he was there was... she was there holding your hand and you guys were like going out for coffee she showed me like she took you guys took you excuse me and there was a group of them you were trying to find her like in a crowded street, it felt like. Um, or that was the dream that you had before, the night before. That could be, but I let me allow me to say this and Lou, interrupt me. And so Luan, I wanted to ask you uh, because Sherry was meditating on the operation the night before and she had this, re, re, like a dream that happened before where she had seen Luana and Luana had told her Think of 1111, 11, we meet at the decimals. Yeah, yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. so, and while she was meditating on this, she went, oh, okay, yes, I remember that dream. And then she said it was like they were traveling in concert together at the same time, like time was moving along and then they were communicating. Mm -hmm. and, and Luana's message was, you know, everything's gonna be okay. This is Richard's journey, you know, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to worry about it. Now, let me just put it this way. When I got to the hospital, I was in room 11. Stop it. When, I, when I talked to the surgeon, he did 11 operations that day. When, and when Luana, when Luana, when Sherry went to pick up my medication, she looked at the clock and it was 11, 11. So were all of those orchestrated or some of those? Absolutely. Or? No, absolutely. Because you don't really pay attention to that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I really don't. I look at it as like, you know. She told you that morning she's giving you comfort because you were nervous about going under, she's saying. And she was giving you comfort, especially Sherry. She was giving Sherry comfort as well. Yeah. Trying to get her own heart down. And she says that Sherry got out of her head though. She was good. And she, hold on. I felt like the signs were more for Sherry, she's saying. It's interesting, you know, and I just happened to look up and look at the room number. There had to be 20 rooms there. That's what my dad, that's how my dad started believing. All the signs that he saw 
He's like, how could that happen? He goes, every bill, every address, our room number was 71. Every When he had a difficult time in the beginning of what I did for work, because he didn't understand it. Yeah. And when we started understanding it, he kept seeing the same number over and over and over again. So then, Luana, if you could just talk about process a little bit, how do you guys do that? How do you, how do you put those numbers in front of us or make us aware? They manipulate us into looking. So like I'll be driving, I never look at, I never look at license plates. And all of a sudden I look at a license plate and there you have it. There's 71 for me. You know, yeah. my sister sees 66. So each person gets different, you know, for Route 66, which was such a big deal the last time we spoke. So my sister ends up, you know, getting different signs. But my dad, the process is that they put our awareness towards either the clock or towards something. They get our attention and then they give us also the thoughts of, hey, we're, you know, we think that we're thinking of them, but they're actually giving us the thoughts that they're thinking of us. And so, Lou, just talk about it a little bit. So, like, because, of course, we pull out a photograph and think of you. We pick up a tchotchke or an object and we think of you. How do you guys think of us? How do, and how does that how does that work? I know you're not floating around watching over us at all times. Our hearts. Our heart, like you've discussed a trillion times, she said, how our heart frequency is, um, show me again. Our hearts call them up. So when we're happy, they come and see us. When we're, you know, super sad, they come and see us to try to elevate our spirits. But a lot of times we can't, it creates a barrier. Okay. And the barrier is just that we can't feel them when we're in. But as a metaphor, would it be a little bit like ringing a bell or of incense coming into your awareness where you start to think of, let's say we're set, something sad happens over here and you're back home and you're doing something else, class, you're in some other adventure, number the realm, and you, what happens? You get a feeling or is it a sensation or is it a visual? Cat. That's so awesome, by the way. That almost sounded like <laughs> what Alfred Hitchcock has. There's, I think so. The answer is frequency. Frequency, but but but, but the interesting part. Hold on, because you showed me something. I want to go back to real fast. They're able to see what we're going through. Right, because the time is so compressed, they can see the beginning of the problem all the way through to the current issue. They can see the endpoints. Yeah, they can see everything. What we're going through. I'm like, can you see us having sex? <laughs> I'm just like, no. Well, people ask that question, and I we've talked about it. They and, do. and it's like, people ask that question. I mean, when I'm in the shower, I'm like, don't look at yourself. Just I'm like, don't look at yourself. Well, it's a little bit like running up to the sandbox and looking at kids playing in the sandbox, and the kids in the sandbox are like, oh my god, they can see me holding this shovel, and you know, it's like you're outside the sandbox going, it, it's a shovel. It's not a big deal, <laughs> you know. I'm, you know, I'm just saying, it's we tend to think of all of this stuff as a big deal, you know, whether right. talking to your loved ones or, you know, whatever. And literally it's on stage and there are props on stage. And if you're sitting close enough to the stage, you can see that it's a prop. It's labeled. It's got a number on it. Boop. They also, they also see us like they see us rejoicing. Like they see our happiness. Like they're able to see, they, hold on a second. They can't interfere. They help, but they can't interfere our process here. That's what we've heard. Yeah. That's they can help, but they can't interfere. And the reason they can't interfere is not because someone's standing behind them with a book. They do, though, when it's not our time. Like being taken out of our bodies, like if there's a crash. Oh, they do interfere. Yeah, if something is not, yeah. not scheduled to be, they'll be there to help out. Or, right. or like a near death experience, and then to help, and the and then you suddenly find yourself back home with them, and they go, eh, "It's not your time yet," but they did show up to tell you it's not your time yet. So now, when you come back to your body and go through all that pain of recovery and everything else, you do remember, oh, you know, I feel like I talked to my relative or my loved one, and they told me I was going to be okay. I just got reminded. So uh, somebody that one, you took a question off of Cora, I believe uh -huh. that we were um, from 
somebody that lost either his wife, I believe it was. And um, I said something about something blue. I can't even remember exactly what it was, but it was one of the first ones. We're like, we're just going to try it and see what happens. Yeah, yes, I remember. Well, that person booked an appointment to tell me even more about that and how amazing it was and how it really started him. Like he was already questioning it, but that really got him into it because we were able to just do that on air with Cora, which is fascinating to me. No, and it is, uh, it is, and it, you know, it's proof of concept, which is what right. Jennifer and I try to talk about. You know, we always try to tell people, look, you can do this on your own. Very important. You don't necessarily, you, you could put Jennifer out of work. She doesn't mind it. You put now, me out of work. I don't mind it either. My dream would be to be out of a job because the world would look so different. So people different. accessing our loved ones. But it's also proof of concept, which is here we are chatting with people on the other side, ostensibly. And sometimes with people we don't even know, we've solicited a question, you know, who do you want to talk to? And somebody gives me a specific detail. And then I'm able to say their first name, Betty, whatever. And then Jennifer's able to say, I'm seeing this and I'm seeing that. And it means nothing to me, of course, because I don't know Betty, but it does to the person who submitted the question. I just had something interesting just shown to me. For instance, I believe this is going to become a lot more natural for people to do, a lot more acceptable, a lot more natural for everybody to start talking to their loved ones. And I think it's already happening, but I was shown a plane. Like even though, you know, planes gave us access to the skies, correct? Right. And just travel. But not everybody likes to fly. Some people prefer boats. Some people prefer other things. Let me ask you, what kind of plane did you see? That's a good question. Like a biplane? No. Or like a jet? Oh, I saw just a big commuter plane. Oh, okay. Jet. Oh, the reason I ask is because I've been saying it recently. It took 66 years to go from Kitty Hawk to the moon. Ooh, yeah. We talked about this before. And so here we are into the fifth year, sixth year of our friendship. But now we're right in the middle. It's not a prop plane and it's not a jet yet. Right. So we're in the middle. And, and that this will become de rigueur or, you know, it doesn't have to become an ad filled, you know, money thing that people are doing. Look what we're doing. We're showing you that on a, on a free platform, YouTube, we can chat with your loved ones. We can help you figure out how to chat with your loved ones. And, right. and anybody can do that. And that there's no commerce involved. We're not trying to sell ads, whatever. Actually, we are for starters you have a movie that's out oh that's I right i forgot and and jennifer has a practice so you can't <laughs> sign up but you know but right, yeah that, the, that's my job and the only part of that was my husband's like if you're going to take this much time away from the family you need to make it worth it yes and, and it, of course and uh, you know I have an office that overlooks the ocean so <laughs> an office that overlooks the ocean that people come to but Anyway, that aside, I'm just trying to say it's not that no, we donate our time too. I donate yeah. all the time to law enforcement. I That's right. You work pro bono for law enforcement I around the country. 20%. I have a huge list of things that I, you know, anyway. No, and I charge people an arm and a leg to sign up for Gaia, $5, where you can watch Hacking Afterlife, Flipside, Talking to Bill Paxton. Amazon Prime right now too. $5 amazing that is amazing so this is great so luana i'm going to toss it back to you my dear if only because we love you we thank you for pulling this together hey i saw that you did a uh one of your things um you know monday oh. hold on you saw your dad when you went under oh is that right i'm consciously not aware of it but what what was that about It's really funny. The architect of the afterlife. He was showing you around. Oh, that's but, sweet. My dad, the architect, yeah. showing me around, introducing me. First, you went back into your childhood and being shown like in Chicago. So you went back into your childhood and then he took you with your mom. You played some piano, they're showing me. And then he's like, hey, let's go check out the next room, the next life. And he took you in, hold on, and wanted to truly show you the architect of the afterlife wow that's fascinating yeah. i have no conscious 
memory of it, but, and Jennifer and I have not talked about this, but she just described, you know, pretty much my dad and my youth and what it was like in my house and what it was like, you know, listening to mom play the piano, which we did every day. Huh. So, by the way, what a, what? what a gift being able to listen to your mom play the piano. You know, I imagine an hour a day, classical pianist. Um, it is when I'm working on this next book, Tuning Into the Afterlife, but it's really about, you know, how musicians somehow seem to find frequencies in an easier fashion. So, but yes, it was a really a magical thing to grow up with. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So give me a second with Luana. She just wanted to mention that. She brought forth your parents. They just wanted you to feel safe. Um, and we do scare the cat. That was right on cue, by the way. <laughs> I believe that. Absolutely. Well, can I tell you the cat has found the exact point where my incision is oh. and, and has jumped on it twice now without jumping on me anywhere else. It's like, Arr. and I think, you know, look, cats obviously see us in a different way. Energy, you know, she's probably trying to figure out what's this new titanium energy going on. Anyway, we love the cat. She's lucky I didn't, you know, yeah. you really because my reaction was like to go, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, well, Lou is now, we've had some really wonderful people show up in class. I mean, Elvis came forward. A lot of people have commented on Elvis's discussion where he talked about crossing over to the flip side and meeting a daughter that no one knew that he had, and he didn't know he had until he saw her, who had passed away before. Um, and that was really beautiful, his description of feeling overwhelming love for the first time in his life. Um, unconditional love that was very powerful. Carl Lemley comes to mind, who showed up a couple of weeks ago, willy-nilly, just knocked on our door and asked if he could talk about how there's so much exciting things to do on the flip side, creating virtual realities, like feature films, trips to Africa, Indian cuisine. And then he said, and when you get bored with creating these fantastic vistas, then you decide to come back to the planet. <laughs> you know, what a different way to look at the flip side of where we're at. You know, if, and of course, you know, somebody wrote this on Quora recently, well, everyone will commit suicide if they think the flip side is so great. And I had to say, the opposite happens. It's that people lose their, once they have an experience, a near-death event, da, 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 statistically shown, people lose their fear of life. Yeah. It's a fear of life that we all carry. Not death, yeah. Fear of not knowing what's going to happen, okay, whatever, but the fear of life is the thing that's predominant. It's also in the research that uh, Helen Wamba did where you know she talked to all these people statistically where they said, I mentioned this in Hacking the Afterlife, that the idea of coming back was the thing that frightened them more than, than going home, which is literally what it is. We go home and then we come back if we choose to, if we have the courage to, if we can volunteer to, and people will believe us when we volunteer and say, yeah, I'll, I'll do these things. I'm laughing because is that, I'm like, is that why Mormons have so many kids so you can come back? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and you, you know, Mormon, that's a very interesting question for, for your dad, of course, who is Mormon bishop. And he understands that we've talked about, you know, the religious aspect versus the reality aspect which is from a science-based thing, you know, like the reports are the reports. And this is true across the board, as we've heard it many times from many different avatars, Hindu avatars, Jesus himself, et cetera, et cetera. They all say, look, all religions point to the same garden. And if the religion has topic of unconditional love in it, then it's in the right garden. So as long as you can focus on the love part, the unconditional love part of whatever religion you follow, you're on the right path. Jim, correct me if I'm wrong about that. Yeah, you are on the right path. You wanna learn about different religions and different spiritual practices. 
in all walks of life, in all different forms of life. And you can almost take it as far as past, present, future, because it's all the same. It is in a sense. Right. I was, I, it was the Dalai Lama's birthday the other day and they were doing a documentary about his life. And had this very profound moment where they were talking about, he learned that compassion and nonviolence, those are the two things that he has focused on in his life, which is really listening to another person. And somebody mentioned this, that was Robert Thurman's uh, wife had told the story, but it was, she said, it, it's a miracle. Whenever I see him meet somebody new for the first time, he listens with complete compassion mm. and is completely present to who they are and what they're doing. So that's a almost impossible thing to do. But if you take that word compassion and just shift it slightly into unconditional love, it's really from the same root. That's awesome. Which is listening with compassion and passion, whatever, and, and trying to hear, or listening with empathy. So, but I just got by doing that, you're 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 sending out more tentacles, I'm seeing, to the flip side as well for help. Like it's almost like it's you're you're taking show me again, hold on. It reverberates in the universe and it comes back to you. So opening your heart, mm -hmm. however you do it. And Luana, we've talked to you about this before. Like what's a method of opening your heart? I mean, you were a lifelong Buddhist and I know you prayed a lot about that. What is something we can tell people in terms of really a simple practice of sitting down, saying a prayer. So for somebody's health, whatever, but opening your heart to somebody what would be a practice, or Jim, which either one of you? By praying, thank you. By praying for others, it comes back to you. And it does it, there's no wrong way to pray. So there's no wrong way to chant or pray. I know some Buddhists are like, no, you have to do it this way. And yeah. warm, you know. But opening up your heart and whatever that feels, whatever feels good to you, or whatever feels right for you at that moment in time, say it. And they asked me to show, like when I saw, you know, when I closed my eyes and I saw what the prayer aspect of it or, or whatever you want to, what, however you want to call it, yeah. um, colors that were beaming out into the universe, like the energy that was going out to the universe. It's like, you know, it's almost like dark matter is a reflection and it bounces right back. So, and there, there's powers, again, we've discussed this, powers and numbers. There's a lot of powerful, you know, powers and numbers. And like when the Buddhists get together and they chant for not their people, but our whole planet, you know, that's very powerful. They've done studies on it as well. I would say also when you go into churches and temples and mosques where everybody in the room is making one prayer towards a specific person, or one prayer towards an event or to help people in some way to become more compassionate or empathetic towards others. I mean, I've seen it, I've filmed it. I mean, I've had that, uh, I was in a mosque in uh, Casablanca and it was the second largest mosque on the planet outside of Mecca. And, you know, hundreds of thousands of people all, you know, pointing one direction and saying a prayer. You could just feel the vibration, you know, of, of that thing of, trying to connect to everybody else. And of course, when we land in our body, hip or no hip, you know, we're, we're, we try to navigate what's going on. And if you can sit down and sort of open your heart towards other people, towards your enemy, towards somebody that's giving you a hard time, even if it's to think, you know, I bet they had a hard time and that's why they're giving me a hard time. Or, you know, because I loved my grandmother, and even though she had a hard life, I bet that she probably was happy when she was a little girl. And let me focus on that. You see? So, <laughs> how do we get so philosophical? I don't know. <laughs> Lou, you got to wrap it up for us. We got five minutes. What's going on? Four minutes. Um, hold on. Okay. 
She wants to talk about the variant. She wants to talk about the what? You mean the variant, the what? V-A-R-I-A-N-T? The, hold on one second. The different strands of the coronavirus, but I feel like we have. Oh, about, okay, let's talk about it. Absolutely. Uh, it's the Delta variant in the COVID. Uh, I've just got off the phone with a friend of mine who was saying, you know, despite it going down in so many places, but that the people who are not vaccinated, that he was saying that 100% of the people who have passed away since this new resurgence are all people who were not vaccinated. It's a much more um, a dangerous variant. But Lou, tell us, what did you want to say about it? They'll remain cautious. Safe and cautious. But not with fear, but still remain cautious. Okay. And are you saying that, I mean, look, people ask us, should we get vaccinated? Should we not? What's the, what's the answer to that? It's, it varies on each person. Okay. That's the, like, you can't ask any more than that. I it really depends on the person. Like you should. Um, They're saying you should you should get vaccinated if you have a way to get vaccinated, but it does vary upon it does vary from person to person. You wouldn't you know would you want a ninety year old to get vaccinated? I'm not sure. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you know, so just to be clear, clarify, you know, Jennifer and I are not doctors, and we're not trying to pass along any information that's related to that. But to what you're saying is that Lou is trying to impart that if you can get vaccinated, you should. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes. Okay, and, and, and then there's always variations within there. Of course, some people can't. Some people might have health issues that doesn't allow them to do that or possible complications or whatever that is. They have to, you know, talk about that with their doctor. But just as a general fatwa coming from the flip side, flip side fatwa headline. Um, that's your advice. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get it, even if you are vaccinated. This different, you know, Delta variant. But it also, you want your immunity to be strong. Correct. And, and like I said, I just got off the phone with somebody who was saying that 100% of the people who are not surviving of this new thing had not been vaccinated. So a reason to sort of, at the very least, if you can do the thing you're supposed to do. Yeah. I know it's a controversial topic. Um, I know, I, this isn't about politics. I'm shocked, I actually thought, we want, I'm like, want it? seriously, you want to talk, what? You want to talk about, <laughs> about something else, you want to flip side? And like, we don't want any more people coming over so quickly. Very funny. But just, I just like still wash your hands, like still all the stuff that people are like a little bit more relaxed upon. Relaxed. I on. see. Continue to do those things. Yeah, and if you feel like you have a cold, don't go out. Don't go out. Um, if you feel like you have, if you feel like you're underneath the, you know, under the weather, stay home and don't take the chance, even if you are vaccinated, of getting it. You know, of getting right because then you can pass it on to somebody else. Right. Well, that's great advice, and I just want to say on behalf of our their dear a friend on the flip side. She was a homeopath and spent a lot of her life not doing and, you know, including when it came to, you know, time for her to do cancer treatment because she had so traumatized by her parents' experience. She avoided it literally like the plague. And so for her to even suggest that people might. I asked her, I'm like, would you do it if you were here? She goes, probably not unless I had access to the flip side. But I just want to speak up on her behalf, which is somebody she probably would not have. Okay. But at the same time, she's saying from that perspective, people should if they could. I yes. know you got to go. Yes. Lou, yeah. thank you for that last little tip. Thanks for keeping an eye on me in the hospital. I appreciate it. For my birthday wishes and happy birthday, Dad. And bye. Love happy you. birthday, Jim. We love you. We love Jennifer. Thank you. Bye.